close your eyes and imagine for a moment walking into a home where the aroma of pepper rasam arises from the kitchen at lunch. At dinner, there's a prawn gashi steaming gently on the table. Early in the morning, Rubindra Shangeet rings out. And by night, we have Bhangra shaking things up. Where rum cake at Christmas and thandai at Holi is considered de rigueur. That, my friends, is my home. It's a mosaic home. Are you wondering how my home came to be this way? Let me tell you a story about it. A long, long time ago, about 150 years ago, this beautiful Kashmiri lady fell in love with a man from Garhwal, and they set the stage for a unique blend of cultures. Their daughter married a Punjabi, and their son was this tall, strapping sports person who met this tiny firebrand of a Bengali artist. The rest, as they say, is history. Those were my maternal grandparents, and my mother is a blend of Punjabi, Kashmiri, Garhwali, Bengali. She then met my father, a Tamilian. And today I stand before you, Smriti Ramek, a unique blend of all those cultures. But the story doesn't end over there. Clearly my genes were seeking this missing piece from the West because I met my husband, a Konkani. Two hearts collided, as they say. 20 years later, I'm, I have two beautiful children sitting in the audience who are an even more unique blend a piece of mosaic, you might call it. In fact, they're almost like the mosaic map of India. What does the uniqueness of this blend tell you? It tells you that it's human nature to migrate, to blend, to fuse, to mix culture, experience, and heritage. And when all these races, communities, and geographies come mixed together and form a melting pot, that is when the most amazing inventions and the most unique ideas are born. The beauty of any mosaic lies in its diversity. The fact that it's irregular, the fact that there are contrasts, this is what makes every story unique. It's what makes it yours. I'm now going to draw your attention to another form of mosaic, which is uniquely mine. It's made up of six words. Storytelling, handcrafted, education, activism, feminism, and entrepreneurship. Now you might wonder, what connects these words? My mosaic mind does. I have a very curious mind, and it's deeply interested in the world around me. I've spent a lifetime investing time, energy, and heart into these six areas. People keep telling me, focus on one interest, but what can I say? Ye dil mange more. And these interests define me. I am a person of many interests and a mosaic mind, and that's just who I am. So let me delve into my first interest, which is storytelling. I told my first story at 18 months, and thankfully the audience was my newborn brother, so he couldn't do anything about it. I then went on to win awards at school. I was on the editorial board for the school magazine, and I chose to study journalism at the college level. I now have a 25-year career in communications. I used to write an award-winning parenting blog for more than a decade. And I am part of an anthology called The Mothers and Others, uh, published by the feminist publishing house Zuban. It was launched at the Jaipur Literature Festival. That brings me to the next one, which is my love for the handcrafted. I grew up wearing saris at the age of 18, and even today I can climb a tree wearing a sari. I will not demonstrate right now. And while the world and our country began to shift towards big brands, big names, uh, mass-produced clothing, I just grew more and more fascinated by the handcrafted, the hand spun, the hand woven, and I began to collect saris from around the country. I've integrated them into my home, and it's almost like a museum of stories, you know. So my couches are upholstered in my nani's old Kashmiri shawl. My curtains are tanchoi's that I pulled out of my wedding trousseau, just mercilessly chopped up and hung them on the windows. And I am one of the 34 women, including Vidya Balan and Shobha Day, who have been interviewed for a book called A Wardrobe Full of Stories, where they've covered women with extensive and unique collections of saris. My third passion is education. So I was raised by my grandmother, who was the founder and principal of two nursery schools in Allahabad, not very far from here. She set them up way back in the 1950s. And she raised me to see education not as the means to an end that I am educating myself for a career, but education as a window into this magical world. 
And I truly believe that we need to see the way, we need to change the way education sees children. Children are not consumers. They are equal participants in the education system. Over the years, I've studied the pedagogies of Sri Aurobindo, Maria Montessori, uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti, and Rudolf Steiner. At one point, I ran this after-school program where we created and curated and crafted uh, specific programs in maths and English for children from K to 12. Soon, education came to matter so much to me, I was so driven by it, that I moved my children to this school in the Palani Hills, uh, where apart from just the regular schooling, they also studied regenerative farming and sustainability. Next up is activism or microactivism. I truly believe that it's not the government that keeps a citizen honest. It is the citizens that keep the government honest. And it is the media that helps citizens do that. And so I got into journalism. After two decades in journalism, I transitioned back into my role as a citizen because that way I got to choose where to put my energies. So be it supporting migrant work workers during the lockdown or be it saving the lake in my little town of Kodaikanal, these are where I choose to put my energies. My efforts are modest, but I am driven by the belief that individual action can bring change and each of us can change our little corner of the world. So while I lend my voice and my support to every section of society, if I had to pick one cause for life, it would be feminism. I believe in equal rights and equal opportunities for all genders, all people. And I believe that that depends on two things. It's twofold. One, you teach children early about the importance of feminism and the importance of equal rights and opportunities. Two, financial independence. If you're not financially independent, it's difficult to find empowerment. And that brings me to my sixth interest, and the last one. It's entrepreneurship. I'm always buzzing with ideas for interesting ventures, and it is in my second innings, my second venture, that brought me to this stage to talk to you all. My pandemic born venture, the Smithsonian. So it was the middle of the pandemic in 2020. My family and I were locked down in this little town called Kodaikanal in the Palani Hills. And I encountered a self-help group of seamstresses, and they were in dire straits. They sewed stuffed toys, you know, little stuffed teddy bears and uh, elephants, and they would export those. But all the trade had ceased in the pandemic, and they had no business, no money coming in. Chance introduced them to me, and I am a person who cannot say no if you ask me for help. The ladies desperately needed an income, and I had to come up with an idea fast. It had to utilize their existing skills, it had to bring in money right away. And I didn't want to help them as an act of charity where I just give some money. I wanted to do something that was meaningful and that created sustainable impact in their lives. And then you know that moment that your whole life has been working up to. I'm not young, I'm 40. My whole life has led me to this moment where the gears moved, the pieces clicked, and suddenly my mosaic mind just fell into place and I knew what I had to do. So I sat down to the drawing with the drawing board and I sketched the outline of a rag doll. It was the first doll I designed, the poet and activist Maya Angelou. This is her. Um, the rest of the ideas came thick and fast. And before I knew it, I had a whole range of rag dolls, all based on feminist icons, made of locally sourced materials by these underserved communities. So currently, I have a range of dolls that include Frida Kahlo, Kalpana Chavla, Sarla Thakral, Maya Angelou, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and a ballerina with a prosthetic leg. And this is just the beginning. I have loads more ideas that I just need to get down to. The dolls are crafted on Waldorf's educational principles with limited features. So children can engage with these dolls. They can draw on their own faces. They can add what they want. They can just let their imaginations run wild. Each doll comes with a little letter. Let me show you. These letters share the story of this woman achiever. And they are stories of brave women who challenged status quo and made a better world for you and for me. It's now been three years since I started making these dolls. And they are just flying off the shelves. The ladies of the groups that I work with have their smiles back and their income. And I just reached into the depths of my mind and found an intersection on the Venn diagram, 
a point where all the mosaic came together to form a brilliant kaleidoscope. Storytelling, handcrafting, education, activism, feminism, entrepreneurship. Now imagine if I'd only ever listened to people and followed that one goal, that one path, focused on that one destination. Would I ever have chanced upon something so fulfilling, something that literally fills every corner of my heart? Mahatma Gandhi once said that the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of other people. And it couldn't have held truer for me. While I was seeking to empower and support the self-help groups, my mosaic mind found that point of intersection where all my interests fell into place and I found my ikigai. That is a Japanese word for finding your joy and purpose. But that's enough about me. What do I want you to take away from this conversation today? One, be curious. The future belongs to people who can learn, unlearn, learn again. I didn't take all those courses on alternative learning so that I could become a teacher. I took those courses so that I could teach my own children, so that I could make education fun and effective for my children. But it didn't, but that learning didn't end there. It went on to shape my dolls. And now that learning has gone far beyond and impacted many more children, hundreds of them. Two, be brave. Be unapologetically, fearlessly yourself. And that doesn't always mean taking on a giant. It means taking a giant leap of faith in yourself. So wear the funny socks, take an unpopular stand. Don't be embarrassed by what you choose. Yes, sometimes you will make a choice that won't work out. And that's fine. You still need to walk that path to get to where you want to be the person that you need to be eventually. The third point, explore. And remember, not all who wander are lost. It's wonderful to have a goal. It's great if you've got single-minded focus. That's fabulous. But it's equally wonderful to be able to simply explore because that is how the most serendipitous discoveries and the most amazing inventions are made. Don't bother with all these lists you see about the top paying careers, the highest paying jobs, the latest technologies that you have to follow. They're not going to lead you to your calling they're going to lead you to somebody else's calling. Leave it to sheep to follow other people. You follow your heart. If you follow your heart, you find your purpose. And when you find your purpose, success always follows because your mind and your heart are aligned. And someday you might just end up giving a TED talk about it. Number four, be empathetic. Empathy, kindness, compassion. These will take you to places that you've never been before. They'll take you into the lives of those who are underserved, those who are marginalized. They will show you things that make you ache, things that break you, things that remake you. And what will emerge is a new person, your heart full of pain and their experiences. It'll give you a perspective to a world that is unseen, one that you've never encountered before. So empathy is one of the greatest facilitators of experience. Last but not least, is my final bit of advice. I'm almost done, thank you. Give every bit of advice a fair chance. Listen to people with an open mind. Thank you, smile at them. But eventually, do what your gut tells you to do. Even if that means disregarding every bit of tried and tested wisdom, do it if that's what your gut tells you to do. And by that I mean, thank you for coming to my TED talk and hearing me out. And if you choose to ignore every bit of <laughs> advice that I've given you today, that is also fine because then too you've taken something away from here. Thank you.